Greetings from New York University. My name is Shabona Wise Ferry, and today we're going to be doing subgroup and abstract algebra. Now, you probably can already guess what a subgroup is from the name alone, but I need to formally explain it. A subgroup is analogous to a subset in that if we have a group of certain elements under a specific operation, then a subgroup, let's say A, B, C. So let's say this is our first group. I don't know. Let's just call it Z. Then a subgroup of this would just be B prime is in Z because it considers just these two elements under the same operation. All right. So that's what a subgroup is. Very basic. You take the same operation and a subset of the element. Now, seems simple enough, but what can we actually do with subgroups? Well, that's where it gets a lot more interesting. Let's start with identity elements. So, we all know what an identity element is. We take an element of our group, and then we use the operation of our group on another element in the group. This element is such that when we compose it with any other element, it gives us back that specific element. So it's just like if we had the real numbers over multiplication, one. Because if we compose it with any real number, it gives us back that exact same real number. Now here's the kicker. We already know that if something is a subgroup of a larger group, then they must have the same identity element. All right? So how do we know this? How can we prove this? Well, let's see. Uh, let's take some, uh, we know that E prime, this different identity element from E, okay, let's establish it in a better way. Cut this out. Right. So, how do we prove this? Well, we know that G has the identity element E, and H has the identity element E prime. Now, since H's element, are all inside D. After all, it is a subgroup. That means that E prime is an element of D. So that means that if this is an identity under the very same operation, then we should be able to take E and compose it with E prime and get E back. But in the same manner, we should be able to compose E with E prime and get E prime back. So that means they're one in the same. Easy. Really simple. So that means that if a group under a certain operation has an identity element, then a subgroup which will share that operation has the same identity element. Great. So now, what other things can we do? Well, you may remember cyclic. Now, remember back when we talked about permutation, right? Most of the functions that we talk about today are, most of the groups that we talk about today are composed of permutations. So, here's an example. The symmetric group that we talked about yesterday contained two, okay. The symmetric group we talked about yesterday was generated by two specific permutations. A, 1 to 2 and 2 back to 1, a transposition, and B, generated by 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 back to 1. Now, it's actually a general rule that these two came together to generate all the elements in S3, aka all the permutations from 1, 2, 3 to some permutation of 1, 2, 3. So, S3 is the set of all of these permutations. And in general, Sn, oh crap, I just did. Sn, the set of all permutations of n consecutive integers, is generated by a transposition of the first two. Well, in essence, this doesn't just work as a transposition of the first two. But we also have that chain that shifts everything over by one. 
one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six, uh, all the way to n, which goes all the way back to one. All right. So now we know how a group is generated, right? Because a group is composed of permutations. And these permutations are all the product of some elementary permutation. Now, you may remember that we called a group cyclic if it could just be generated with one permutation. Well, let's try and come up with an example. Let's say our group is generated by one permutation, only one under composition. And so I'm going to make that permutation be 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6. Beautiful. 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 5, 5 goes to 2, 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 6, and 6 goes all the way back to 1. All right. Well, this gets boring after a while because alpha to the 7 is just alpha again. So instead, I'm going to create two different loops. So now we have 1, 3, 5, 2, and 4, 6, 8. Great. Oh, wait, I forgot 7. Oh, whatever. No one cares about 7. Oh, maybe let's just include them in here. Okay, so we go from 1 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 2, and back to 1, 4 to 6, 6 to 8, 8 to 7, and back to 4. So now we know all the elements of our group are generated by... Let's just keep it simple. 1, 3, 4, 2. Okay, we're going with that. Cut out all the previous ones. Okay. So 1, 3, 4, 2. All right, so what's the group generated by this? Well, we have alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed, and then alpha to the fourth. Since this is just one cycle, alpha to the fifth is equal to alpha again. Uh, what I mean by that is, it's like we're sifting everything over one. One goes to three, then three goes to four, then four goes to two, and then if you do that four times, wait, it actually goes back to one. So in fact, alpha to the four doesn't exist either. It's just these three. Alpha, alpha to the two, and alpha to the three. Oh, wait. Yeah. So, what are these permutations? Well, it's 1, 3, 4, 2. Then we apply it again. So 1 goes to 3. And where does 3 go? Well, to 4. And then where does 4 go? Where? Okay. Well, we know that 1 goes to 3. Then 3 goes to 4. Then 4 goes to 2. And 2 goes back to 1. So what happens when we compose these two on one another? Well, I think it's easier to visualize when we're doing the matrix version. 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2, and 2 goes back to 1. All right. So then let's do this twice. 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4. Then 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3. 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2. And, well, I mean, the only thing left is 1. Finally, a to the 3. What permutation is that? Well, we go, well, we go 1, 3, 3, 4, 4, 2, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 4, 3, 4, 4, 2, 2, 1, and the last one left is 3. Now look what happens when we try to apply it four times in a row. 1, 3, 3, 4, 4, 2, 2, 1. So it just maps back to itself. 1, 3, and I mean it just continues. So the only unique ones in the set are E, alpha, alpha squared, and alpha cubed. All right, great. So now we know what our set is made of. This is what we call a cyclic group, right? Because everything is generated just from composition of this one element over itself. Alpha, alpha comp composed with alpha, alpha uh, composed with alpha, composed with alpha, alpha composed with alpha, composed with alpha, composed with alpha. Okay, that's kind of tongue twisted. All right, great. So now 
let's prove that every group has a cyclic subgroup. Now, here's the thing. We know that every group is generated by some amount of elementary permutations, right? It's not like every single thing is unique. So, we have alpha, beta, gamma, delta. It doesn't matter how many we need to use to get the point across. So, let's just start simple and go with alpha and beta to make this the simplest non-cyclic kind of group. So, everything is generated by alpha, beta. Maybe, let's say, that our two permutations for alpha is 1, 2, 3, and beta, well, okay, let's say it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and beta is 1, 3, 4, well, okay, 1, 2, 4, 3, 5, writer's block. So, how can an entire set just be composed of these two? Well, here's the kicker. This thing loops back on itself after a cubed, three iterations. And this thing loops back on itself after a squared, two iterations. Meaning that for both of them to loop around, then alpha to the six must be the identity, leaving every power before it to be unique. And beta to the 5, like in the example we did before, is the identity. So, what are our unique options? Well, it's alpha, uh, beta, alpha squared, alpha cubed, alpha to the 4th, alpha to the 5th, beta squared, beta to the 3rd, beta to the 4th, the identity, which is just sitting there, and then, of course, whatever products of the two that we want to pick and choose, even though it's likely not all of them are actually unique in that way. So, let's say that our group looks like this, right? So now, what is a cyclic subgroup we can pick out of this? This is clearly not cyclic, but what's a cyclic subgroup we can pick out of this? Well, we just pick one of the generating elements, and we pick all of the powers of it, that remain in there. See, this makes a cyclic subgroup, does it not? So, we just write alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed, alpha to the fourth, and alpha to the fifth. Under the same operation, all of these are generated by the same group. And of course, we have to include the identity as well. Great, so now we know every group has a cyclic subgroup as well.